Hi everyone, Florence Theriault here again, ready to bring some of my good friends to share with you uh, things that I, dolls that I've had a wonderful opportunity of living in the midst of for the past several months, preparing for this wonderful catalog. Most of the dolls in this collection are from the private collection, in this auction, are from the private collection of Susan Hill of Virginia. And I do want to comment, whoever ends up owning any of the dolls that Susan Hill owned is getting a doll that's going to bring good vibrations to their home. I have been deluged with phone calls from her club members and from people who knew her and said what a wonderful woman she was and she loved her dolls so much, she cherished them and she was so proud of them and she was such a kind and good person. So this is what doll collecting, what our whole community of collecting is about and I wanted you to share, I wanted to share that with you about um, comments that people have made to me and gone out of their way to call and tell me about Susan Hill. There are other dolls in here that are from a wonderful private collection um, from Wisconsin. And in a curious twist of fate, both Susan Hill and our Wisconsin collector had a love for Simon and Halbig dolls. And that is why I've decided to make the main talk um, about this auction and the wonderful dolls from the Simon and Halbig company. In particular, I want to talk to you about Carl Halbig. I think as we collect, we, le we learn to, we, we want to learn and celebrate the people that made and brought these dolls to us from the past. And we, there are certain names like we know, we say their name, Emile Jumeau, for example. We'll say his name when we think of his doll firm. When we say Simon and Halbig, we say Simon and Halbig, and it kind of flows off the tongue and we don't really pay any attention to who the people were. So it turns out, when I went back and re did some reading about it, the man, the man, the point man, the person who really was responsible, it appears, for most of the activity of this firm during the 51 years of which he was the owner and manager and inspiration of the firm was Carl Halbig. Carl Halbig lived from 1839 until 1926. And in 1869, 1869, he formed a partnership um, with, with Wilhelm Simon, and they formed the company known as Simon and Halbig, which we now just use that term when we refer to their dolls. But let's talk about Carl Halbig. Um, he seemed to be a man with an absolute vision of what he wanted to do. Remember, most of the firms in Germany, with the exception of firms like Kestner, for example, that was a big porcelain manufacturing firm of their own, but most of the firms in Germany, doll firms, were little small, you could almost call them studio companies. They might even have 100 employees working for them, but they probably mostly had home workers that would pick up work, take it home, assemble dolls, sew costumes. This was not the case for Carl Halbig. The, the Simon and Halbig firm built a large porcelain manufacturing firm, and that is what they were, manufacturers of porcelain. Which is why, as the years went by, they not only produced dolls that carried their own insignia, that were, that were their product that they marketed, that they sold, but mostly, mostly, they made dolls or doll heads for other companies who commissioned them from them, and we're going to see that as we go along. Well, I decided I would, as I was working on this collection, I was really excited because I began to see this vision that the, our, my two collectors, whose collections I was working on, had when they were assembling th their dolls. They were trying to put together a comprehensive list of all of the models that had come out from the hands of, not his hands directly, but his thinking hands, of Carl Halbig from his firm over its 50 years of existence. And I wanted to follow the track because to me this firm was so, so pivotal. And I want to start to give it its recognition in the doll world. Stop just thinking, oh, they're German dolls. They're not. They're important in the whole history of doll making. I want to take you through the life and works of Carl Halbig as, we, as seen through his dolls. Very interesting to me was the fact that his dolls went through this whole transition period of dolls from the 1869, 1870 period, right on up through um, the 1920s when he left the firm when, and shortly thereafter died. Um, it was very interesting because we go from the early German doll period of sculpted hair dolls to the 
closed mouth doll period, and I'm going to give you a few new perspectives on that, to then moving into what is commonly known as the art character doll movement and show you all of the transitions of things that went along. I hope during this talk you'll start to realize also that Carl Halbig was simply not a maker of uh, dolls for the German market, but he also secretly, behind the scenes, produced many of the bisque doll heads that were put on French dolls, on Roulet and Decamp Automaton, that were put on some of the later Jumeau and SFBJ dolls. And these are very, very important. This was an important man, and we need to start saying his name more. Repeat after me, Carl Halbig, important doll maker of the 19th century. The, the firm had, when they first started out, were making many things, like a lot of the porcelain firms were in Germany. They made everything from doll tea sets to figurines to bathing dolls, which we commonly call frozen charlottes, to little bisque novelties. But sometime around um, late 1870, or 1870s, they also began to produce dolls. And I, want, I have some here, and I'm going to show you kind of in sequence the various molds that went along. And so over here on my right-hand side, we're going to see some of the earliest works coming from the Simon Halbig Company. I'm going to step over here to, to kind of work with you. One of the dolls in which he clearly was inspired by the French market was his very, very sought-after doll, which collectors commonly call the twill-bodied Simon and Halbig fashion doll. Her body is not kid, it is kid or twill, a twill fabric stretched over a carved wood, and she's completely articulated, which would be a desirable feature, a lady body, not slender, slender lady, but not plump, hooray type um, body also, but a very lovely body with beautiful bisque arms, and definitely made to be presented as a lady doll. And we have here a very superb example of the twill-bodied uh, Simon and Halbig doll. Simon and Halbig was very involved in the making of bisque dolls with sculpted hair in different variations, basically the same variations on a theme. And actually, once you've seen several of these dolls, a facial model is very, very distinctive in what he did. This is a very good example, and I'm going to hold it up so the camera can come in very closely on it. He made them with painted eyes or with glass eyes. He made them with a variation of body. Some were small enough that they were perfect for dollhouse, as the one little lady standing down below her here. Some he made with the same basic hairstyle, but differences in variation. For example, if you look at these two dolls, very, very similar. One is a straight shoulder head, but one is a swivel head. They have a very similar hairstyle. One has a green bow, one has a black hair band, and her hair waves differently in the front and she has glass eyes as well. But she has pierced ears and she doesn't. So already they were experimenting with different levels of um, luxury and extra details in the production of a doll. So we have three examples. They made many, many <clears throat> of bisque dolls with sculpted hair, but at the same time also there were about three or four other firms that were doing this. Most of these are not marked. A lot of research has been done People are able to pinpoint the things or to make, I think, reasonable assumptions that they were the work of a certain firm. Um, but unless they actually, we have found examples that have the initials or the mold numbers or makers of a firm, we really can't be absolutely de I definite. Luckily, the Simon and Halbig of this, in this style are very, very often marked with the initials S and then an H. They're very, very beautiful, beautiful examples. I love them. They also started to produce just a very simple doll without a mold number. This is very beautiful from 1880 period. It does not have a mold number. I want you to see her beautiful wig. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous wig. Those side braids, she's wonderful. But she does not have anything except the markings <coughs> S and H. Closed mouth, lovely. I have included the tall girl up here. Not because she is a signed Simon and Halbig. In my opinion, however, she is one of their early works. And again, I'm going on the characteristics of the style of decoration they did, the type of modeling we did. But unless we actually have a mold number stamped on it or their initial stamped on it, 
the best we can do is attributed to. And I think it's folly to do otherwise, although some, I think most people would definitely say it's Simon Halbig. We simply have to say attributed to. What, to me, one of the really stunning dolls from Susan Hill's collection, very, very rare and beautiful doll. And I'm going to actually lift her down now. So I do not have a doll towering above my head. Well, one of the reasons that dolls were not being um, marked with a model number was until 1887. So this is now the firm was formed in 1869. And by the way, I want to just stop a minute and point out to you what was going on in France, 1869. We were just working toward um, the beginning of a really developed French market. In 1867 had been the Paris International Exposition where so many of the Parisian doll makers had shown their fashion dolls and had won awards. And they surely had an inspiration on the German doll makers who started to go to Paris and see this international market developing. <clears throat> and they decided they wanted to have a piece of the pie. Many of them set up uh, offices or um, studios in Paris where they would watch for the latest designs to come out from the, from the Paris designers. And then they would either make their German rendition of it on a little more of a budget scale, or they would approach the, Germ the French firms and say, would you like us to make the porcelain heads for you? And this is what um, Karl Halbig did in many cases. Well, in 1887, things changed in Germany. At that time, a GM um, office was set up in Germany, and doll designs and doll heads began to be registered. And this is the first time where we start to see Karl Halbig um, design or register many of the models that he could have been producing for, for up to a decade, but we have no way of knowing. We have to assume, and I'm going to show you as I go along some of these models, we have to assume that many of them had been in production already before he registered them, because in 1887 and 1889, he had a raft of model numbers that he deposed. It's not likely that he designed that many in one year. He just simply, the office opened up and he went and registered them. One of the first he registered, and this is a really rare doll, um, and he actually makes particular mention of it, of, of this doll. In fact, it's the first doll that he registered and he, it was his model 202. There's been some conjecture over the years that he might have been instrumental in the development of the Jumeau 200 character series. And in my opinion, this has never been totally proved one way or another and still needs to have research done on it. But certainly remember, this goes into all of this more research that needs to be done. It's really exciting the kind of fields that we could get into. Now look, we have this wonderful little smiling face doll, and I'm going to show you a model similar to it in a minute. But then look what happens, and this is what he deposed. And you flipped it over, and on the other side, you had the scowling face. Um, he didn't really perfect the system of, of the head movement, as it had, was developed later on by Carl Bergner when he did his multi-head doll, for which, by the way, Simon and Halbig made the heads. So, so much, Simon Halbig was in, so involved with all of these little firms. Now, he registered then, starting in 1887 and 1889, he began to register a group of doll molds, and I'm going to run you through some of these so you can see the plethora of doll models that he did and how important they were. But before we do that, just take a little group, the little group I have up here, because our two collectors, happily for us, also, and this is just a small sample of what's in the auction, put together met all of the examples of the little all bisque dolls that were made by Simon and Halbig. This is the, the example of the very famous black stocking girl. Most of the um, all bisque miniature dolls fell into the 800 model character series, although some of them were in the 700 but mostly in the 800. We have the Asian with their very distinctive white stockings and the little blue slippers with the upturned toes. And then we have a barefoot girl. So when collectors are looking for these, they're trying to find all of these different variations. And we have a girl with wonderful peach stockings and very fancy shoes. 
and look at their faces. Every one of these faces is different. The camera will scan over them and you'll see. Even then, Halbig was not going for just the same look, the same look. He really was trying to find expression and character and different um, representations of different cultures and different children in his dolls. Well, the first dolls that he, I'll move these over now so we can start to see some of these others. I think that doll is so beautiful. I'm so proud of her because she said, I have no, you can't identify me except that I'm made by Simon and Halbig, but I have no model number. You just have to look at me and love my beauty. Now, we now move over here and I'm going to show you the first series that he then, that he registered was his Simon and Halbig series, or his, seven, his 700 series. And it was a very complicated system. If any of you are lucky enough to own the long out of print, um, you're going to marry Ann Cieslik's German doll study, or Encyclopedia of German Doll History. You will see in there a complete inventory of all of the known examples of um, Simon and Halbig that have been registered, although I am going to show you w at least one today that does not appear that it was ever registered, so that would make it real rarity, or else when they were going through all of the court papers, they couldn't find it at the time. Um, but we're going to start right here, and please look at this group, 700 models, and what are you seeing? When you look at their faces, what do you see? I do not see the same face. I see character, I see expression, I see moods, and what comes to mind? We always talk about the art character dolls of the 1910 period, but now we're talking the 1880s. This is, what is that, um, 20 years earlier, 20 to 25 years earlier? This was a whole art character movement in itself. So never underestimate that this man was such a, uh, so foreseeing in what he was doing. And do compare this with the French bebés of the period that tended to be very just beautiful, perfect children. But no, Carl Halbig went for expression. This would be one of my favorites. I love this little girl. And she is with a closed mouth. Look at those wonderful eyes. He very often had beautiful, almost French quality eyes on his dolls, by the way. And 719 model and she has a closed mouth. Now, we're going to move over here, and next to her is one of the most beautiful dolls in the auction. Everything about her, her costume, everything. She's also 719 model, but look at her mouth. Open mouth. This is what you're going to find over and over again with the Simon and Hal big series. He went for variation within a model number. He might have open mouth. He might have closed mouth. Sometimes he had a just slightly open mouth. Sometimes painted eyes. Sometimes glass eyes. Different um, complexions. He might use the same model and have a, a brown complexion doll. He might have this one where there's a Native American, um, Asian. It, very, very different. So watch for these variations within. And that's what our collectors were doing. They were trying to show, as they put their collections together, the many variations that were occurred. So two 719 models, one open mouth, one closed mouth, and achieving different looks. And then he had this wonderful 749 model and French body made for the French market. That's very, very important because over and over again, we find out that Carl Halbig had established good relationships with French doll makers, and he would uh, create many dolls for them. Many of the dolls that were sold, for example, in the de uh, Paris department store, uh, luxury department store of Eau Non Bleu, with their wonderful uh, costumes that were assembled in the ateliers of Eau Non Bleu, were actually using the bisque heads of Simon and Halbig, and we find that over and over again. When I was first going to France, like, 25, 30 years ago, when really when European countries hadn't really opened up to each other and the French community of dolls that people own tended to be very still um, bound into their own history. You didn't find a lot of American dolls there. You didn't even find a lot of German dolls in Paris. But you did find French dolls with German heads that had originally been made for the German market. And the 749 model would pop up quite a bit. So I tend to think that it might have been a specific model made for the French market, but 
nothing conclusive about that. But that's a sweet little girl. But she's marked 749. Now this is a curiosity coming in the 739, 700 series because most of the black dolls appear later on in like the 1300 series, but that's okay. This is a really gorgeous one. And look at her smiling expression. That is absolutely wonderful. The 739 model, 739, this model came with either open mouth or closed mouth. And very important that it has like this wonderful original body that matches the complexion of her face and collectors are really looking for that type of thing. So here again, registered in 1888. This was registered in 1888. This was 20 years before the art character movement in Germany. Very important um, feature to know and recognize that character dolls were already being made in the 1880s. And the final example I have from the 700 series is a girl that is broadly smiling. In fact, I really think she's the same as the smiling face on this little two-faced doll that we showed earlier. Here, I'll hold it up and you can make your decision what you think. One having an open mouth and one having a closed mouth. Um, but she is really quite wonderful. And again, whereas the black doll next to her has a slightly um, Slight, a hint of a smile, she has a broad smile. This is a very, very highly, highly expressive feature. Do remember, even though the 700 series were all registered in 1887, it doesn't mean that's when they began to be made. They could have been being made for five, six, seven years, and only when the registration office opened in Germany in 1887 were they bang, 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 all registered at that time. And then I'm going to move on and show you another series.